Buddha, Jesus, Krishna, bless us all, slam and stand, sending salutations, so salivating, so salviatic, thank you to Antone the Ripper, Leone, no, no, not Leone, what the hell am I talking about, I'm already spacing on you, Antone the Ripper, Viviano, the cyber shaman who healed my unhealthy internet exploratory device, oh yes, it is Thursday, October 22nd, and Halloween approaches, La Park of poaches, big daddy's roaches, behold the eupolictic lyric Spanish, the Gahardian spirit, there baby, there baby, there baby, Johnny Legend, are you proud of me, yet I have not stammered one bit, I flubbed my lines big time, look at the fan above me, it's fiddling, back and forth, back and forth, god damn it, back and forth, fuck the psychics, fuck the faith healers, fuck the motivational speakers, every last one of them, I want to hear an amen baby. Do I hear an amen, baby? Where are all of you? I want to hear an amen, baby, from all of you. This is Slam and Stand number 16. Alfredo Esparza, do I hear an amen, baby? Amen. Oh, thank God. <laughs> thank God. Thank gonna... Krishna. Cats. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Buddha. I was going to give you uh, five, five seconds of silence at that moment. Oh, wow. If you know, that... I'm not, I'm not going to talk religion. Oh, yeah, yeah, we, we, we can't talk religion because it's, as Jello Biafra once said, if Jello Biafra once said, if you love God, burn the church. You know we'll get riled up and start get offending a lot of people. Definitely, definitely, but it will lead them to pure spiritual salvation. Now, will I read Hulk Hogan's new book? <laughs> no. You know what? Yeah. No! Why? Because when I read fiction, I like it well written. That's why. For you know what we're going to be reading? We're going to be reading Hulk Hogan and the Magic Johnson Larry Bird book. Are we going to kind of meld them together, just kind of rip out the pages, wrap them up, blend them together, rewrite history? Or Wait, history? No, rewriting fiction. That's what it all is, baby. You know it's, what's so funny when you hear about all these books coming out from guys who were big in the 80s? What would it, what, none of this stuff would have existed if there was the Internet. Because, I mean, nowadays we all know our sports athletes, all our wrestlers are pretty fucked up. <laughs> so, this is so true. And is it me or back before the Internet, I, did people just take so much of what they said for granted in every memoir, every biography? Now it seems like every urban legend is exposed, you know, Go back to James Frey and A Million Little Pieces. He probably could have gotten away with passing that off as a bona fide, factual autobiography 20 years ago. But, man, you fuck around with that shit, people call you on it. Yeah, and, and that's what's going to end up happening with Hulk Hogan and all the... I, I, wonder, I wonder what he's going to talk about, what he's going to rip, who, if he's going to rip anybody. Hulk Hogan or Magic yeah. Johnson? Well, Hulk Hogan. Well, we already know Magic Johnson's <laughs> already... Magic Johnson's already put um, Isaiah Thomas under the bus. This is true. Yes, you were you were informing me on that. That sounds like a fascinating read in itself. And Hulk Hogan, yeah, I picture Hulk Hogan trying to just bury a lot of people when, in fact, he's unintentionally burying himself with every paragraph he and his ghostwriter have written. You know, the the, the the sad thing is, like, I know, like, with at least with the Magic Johnson Larry Bird book, you have a writer who's kind of credible, you know, in Jackie Mc, McMullen. But then, like, with Hulk Hogan, who wrote his book? I, do, do you have any idea who's... Who you know, I don't know. I is it one of those ECW press guys, or most likely? And in fact, that's a, another brilliant, you know, beautiful thing about the internet is we can just float around onto just... Amazon.com. Why don't you just do a quick search and find out? Yeah, I'm going to books right now. It's Amazon.com. I am on their site right now, and while I am looking up. The Hulk Hogan book. I want to apologize to my dear brother-in-law, my awesome cuñado, for accidentally calling Anton the Ripper Leone. <laughs> although that's why I gave him the handle in the first place. Did he fix your computer? He fixed my computer. My oh, God, yeah. it is running fast again. It's just like, man, I drank a lot of tea today. It was bitching. What, what did he tell you? What was the problem? Oh, I don't know. He just works magic on it. He, he <laughs> put in. He doesn't he, tell you, you know anymore. me in a computer. I'm sorry. He doesn't tell you anymore. He doesn't. He figures you don't know. Now nah, he told me, but you know my mind and computers. I forget everything. I just kind of, 
You know, I think along the lines of the astral plane, I think along the line of Zen riddles, and if it's not a Zen riddle, I mistakenly think it's a Zen riddle. Um, but I, he said something about putting a, inserting a new card or something like that, and uh, oh yeah, 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 and uh, there's some software called like Easy Link that he we had uh, loaded onto our computer, and he unloaded it, and he looked at me and he said, "You know what I think of Easy Link?" and he made a jack off motion. <laughs> so. I guess that's one of the things that was totally fucking up our computer. Yeah. Um, okay, so I am on the Amazon.com site, and Hulk Hogan, uh, Hulk Hogan, parentheses, author, and I'm making the same jack-off motion that my cuñado made, and it uh, looks like his ghostwriter is a, name, a guy named Mark D'Agostino, and I'm clicking on his name to see what else he did. And the only... <laughs> Oh, this is too sweet. This is too sweet. Okay. This guy, Mark D'Agostino, his only other literary involvement is a book called Fantastic Four Visionaries. Oh, that George, doesn't surprise me. <laughs> yeah, and you know how many, you know what its uh, star rating is? It gets one star. You know, I was going to say, I was going to say, well, what, what, what did you write, like a comic book or something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it, and no disrespect to anybody who writes comic books. It's just one of those weird things where... Yes, it, it, I, absolutely. No disrespect for those who write comic books, especially the awesome Hernandez brothers. Yeah, it's just one of those things where you kind of figure it's somebody of that who's written something fiction. <laughs> you got to exactly. be good at fiction. You have to be good at fiction to write about wrestling. This is very true. This is very true. And then the true genius can write that fiction as nonfiction and convince people it's nonfiction. That's where the trick comes in. It is very, very difficult, in my opinion. I don't know if I could pull it off. You know, the good thing about Hulk Hogan's book is maybe he's written about so many people that are dead that it doesn't really matter <laughs> if it's right or wrong. So oh, my gosh. I wonder died. if he has a chapter devoted to the dangers of tanning beds. He does? No, I was wondering if he does. That, oh was, that could take a pass. I was like, book. oh, my God, that's actually awesome. I would actually be interested in reading it. Yeah, so would I. So would I. All right, you know, he, it's, he says it's about his life outside the ring. I wonder if, oh. I wonder if everything he done, he, that he's done outside the ring starts with Ricky Shoshu like his Japan wrestling career did, that dimwit. <laughs> oh, God. Well, you know, one of the reasons I mentioned at the beginning of the show that it is October 22nd. It's because October 22nd is the 30, you know, today is the 37th anniversary of the biggest wrestling show in Argentina's history. And that was the most prolific match between Martin Caravaggian and La Momia, the one uh, that had the whole media you know, clamoring over, sell out of 22,000 people, uh, had, you know, the mainstream media speculating on who is the man under the mummy mask. And it was the magazine Gente that discovered that it was, in fact, Juan Dos Santos, who is the best person ever to play La Momia, uh-huh. in my opinion. Although I did not see the first man, Ivan Kowalski, who played the role. But uh, Juan Dos Santos perfected that role, and whoever uh, did it afterwards, I think it was several different players, uh, didn't have it. But anyway, I won't go on too long about Titanis in this episode, although I will in another, but I just want to say October 22nd, 1972 was the biggest wrestling show, probably not just in Argentina history, but all of South American history. Okay. Actually, all of North American history, too. I mean, who else? Actually, the entire world, to be honest. I, You know what? You're absolutely right. Maybe the universe. The universe. I don't think, yeah. I who know. else besides Martin Carr the Young could sell out a 22,000-seater against a mummy? Nobody else can, and I don't think anybody else will. That, And the only reason nobody else has tried is because they know that they would fail big time. You, you know, DDT would probably try. They've been trying a lot of weird stuff lately. So Yes, yes. Now, there's an intriguing character. They've, they've kind of been a little bit off. Well, I mean, they've been doing that for years, but they would yes. actually give it a shot. <laughs> They're one of those. 
Well, you did get to see that um, Takagi the Stuke match, right? No, I did not. You haven't? Well, you, have, you, have you seen the clip? Or is, you just you just know what I told you? Is that all? Yeah, that's just just from what yeah, you told me. It's, it's all news to me. Tell you know, you know the best the best thing about that whole thing. I mean, actually, <laughs> it didn't make it. It didn't make it on the on the video. It, it didn't make it. I don't think it's online or anything. It might be. Uh, but at the end of the show, mm-hmm. they're showing um, Takagi's. I guess it's a search for um, the Great Sasuke. Yes. And he he finds them at a at one of those like um, those you know those little um, ca- cafeteria trucks. A cafeteria witch? You know those little trucks that they had, those little like vans or whatever. They're, they're oh like, yes, yes. Those like a taco truck. Yeah, those things. He's working in one of those, and he's got that. He's got that head. Um, the hair, the hair, that thing covering his hair. His hair. He's dressed all like a <laughs> like a bum and everything. It's so funny. The oh, that's brilliant. brilliant. But I mean, anyway, let's let's get to Peril the Mall. Since we yes, now it. in my mind, that's actually the big news of the week, only they because. Made it they actually made it on TV, which is yes, which is that nice. shocked me. Of course, you know they their their show aired competing against um, CMLL Puebla. But what I find so intriguing about this is I really thought this was going to be one of those deals where they were on the verge of a TV deal. Uh huh. And from what I understand, it's not a huge splash in that there was absolutely no television commercials on the show, which. Which kind of uh, gives away that they're probably, you know, paying an arm and a leg just to get yeah. it on the air. But the fact that they accomplished that so far. Well, I mean, there's a lot of promotions that have made it on TV, so <laughs> it shouldn't be a big accomplishment. <laughs> you know, it, it was 30 minutes, and the show, I mean, it didn't look that good. I mean, it, it, I mean, it had good rust. It, it can't be that bad <laughs> when you see some of the crap that makes it on TV nowadays. Yeah, this is it's true. Like AAA. You um, are not kidding about that. But it actually was, I mean, it was 30 minutes. I mean, what else, What more can you do with 30 minutes? It's like that. That's not, yeah, that's nothing to sneeze at. I think if you do it's already right. online, though. <laughs> it's What's on that? YouTube. It's on YouTube already. Oh, that's, well, that's cool. I mean, I can yeah. actually, <laughs> it's even obtainable by me. You can actually maybe watch it if you want. <laughs> if you actually, it's kind of like that. Maybe I'll watch it. Maybe I won't. You know, <laughs> it's, it's really, I don't know. Like I, I think that what the only thing they they showed the, they showed the Cassandro match and then they showed the, the main event match, but they didn't show the, they didn't show the finish of the, well they showed the finish but they didn't show what the post match. So post-match we're talking match two goal. matches. Yeah, two matches. Basically just the matches. And now when you say the Cassandro match, was this a singles match? No, it was a tag match. Him and um, X Y. Remember Mosco? Mm-hmm. Oh yes, him and um and Cassandra versus two masked guys like these stripper looking dudes <laughs> with masks. And thirty minutes, you know, it's intriguing enough that I am gonna watch it before I go to bed tonight. You might. Yeah. No, I will. <laughs> thirty minutes. Thirty minutes isn't as bad as like two hours of Raw. Or... Oh, exactly. Or or you know, two hours of Triple A. You know, I mean. Well, it's- Triple A is, you know, the bad thing with Triple A is it, it, it's not just that it's two hours. There's like a full, like, like it's 45 minutes of commercials, like nonstop commercial after commercial where it's like, you're watching. Exactly. It. And I was on the verge of really enjoying it a few months ago, and it's yeah. starting to dissipate for me. I don't know if it's just, you know. Plus, even if you, like, even if you, like, if you watch it on DVD or you're watching it on TiVo or, or something else like that. Even if you're like skipping through it, you could tell that there's a lot of editing on the show. Right. Well, in fact, when I when you were mentioning about Paris de Mal being a 30 minute show, yeah. If you edit it right, you can do a lot with 30 minutes. Why? Well, Back in 1977, they used to air All Japan Women's here in Los Angeles, uh-huh. and that was a 30 minute show, and they had a great introduction that was a at least a few minutes, that featured the beauty pair, Jackie Sato and Maki Ueda, singing their introductory theme song. They'd have two matches, sometimes only one, if if it was a two out of three fall, and then they would finish it with a pre- pretty uh, lengthy finale by the beauty pair. And to this day, it was probably one of the, I would say it was one of the five best wrestling TV shows I've ever seen. Yeah, I, I mean, it all depends on how you edit it, too. Like, I mean, exactly. 
Well, and I think that was the brilliance with the All Japan's women's back then. I also think that was what was brilliant about ECW TV. Yeah, that's what I was going to mention. Because, yeah. I mean, you, you could hide so much of the stuff. Like, I mean, even, like, Paul Heyman, when he was doing that that um, that um, that podcast, he was saying how how when uh, Public Enemy won uh, Tag Team of the Year, he he brought up how, how yeah, I did, a br- I, I take a, I, I, I did a brilliant job on that. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know. I he kind of made it. That was like, great. He that was excellent. Seem like they were really quite bad. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's. I mean, it's true. These weren't the strongest workers, the most charismatic workers. It's been said many times. Paul Heyman knew what to do with them. And you know, when I say ECW being a great show because of how it was how it was edited, that is not a backhanded comment in any way. I think there is an absolute art to making any kind of a show, especially a wrestling show, and presenting it as something entertaining. I mean, I remember when ECW, before it actually had any you know, airtime on any of the cable stations here in Southern California, I was waiting with bated breath to get my ECW tapes. I usually got them through my buddy Ron Head. I mean, it, it was must-see TV. And it wasn't just because it was extreme and it was hardcore and bloody. It's because this was a great television show. Yeah. Kurt, we have a caller on the line. Who do we have on the line? You have the one that's not Steve Sims. This uh, is Dixie Baby. <laughs> we don't have Steve Sims. Oh, no. Dr. Kurt, have the other fan. one. The other one. Hey. How are you guys doing? We uh, we are doing really well, and before I say anything else, I just want to say that was an awesome interview you did with Cassandro. That Thank was you. totally cool. In fact, plug it right now. Plug your site right now because everybody must listen to this interview. And we'll forget, too. <laughs> uh, loser, <laughs> loserleavestown.net or davidbix.com, and that's the whole archive of the podcast, and that one is the next to most recent one, and that has both Cassandro and TJ Perkins, who was just on Raw and ECW this week. And the latest show is myself, Rob Naylor, and Colt Cabana talking about midgets. Oh, that! Oh, I'm there. <laughs> I am so there. Are these the classic midgets from the U.S.? Yes, main, mainly talking about the classic midgets. Okay. The classic midgets that would rip off the toupee of the referee and bite him on the butt and run between his legs. Not the high-flying lucha midgets. Exactly. Some high-flying. <laughs> Some of them were high-flying, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> Sky Lolo. Sky Lolo. Haiti Kid. Haiti Kid, yes, yes. Coconut Willie. Kurt, who's going to get in the Hall of Fame for Sky Lolo or Fabulous Moolah? Uh, my prediction is they're going to remove Bret Hart from the Hall of Fame and replace him with Sky Lolo. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess that was Bret Hart's big, big – one of his beefs was that Greg Oliver and Steve Johnson rated Sky Lolo higher than Bret Hart in the ha- Canadian Hall of Fame. Yeah. But I, I, I think Bret Hart was getting a bit defensive because he was worried that people might read into you know his – his criticisms of Sky Lolo because I have it on absolutely no authority that Bret Hart actually stole a lot of his act from Sky Lolo. <laughs> well, he accused Flair of doing that. He accused who? He accused Flair of stealing his act from Jackie Fargo, Fargo and Midget. Holy shit. <laughs> brilliant wrestlers are not necessarily brilliant people, I guess. <laughs> I'm not going to speak ill of Greg Oliver this week, though, because I just wrote my, wrote a piece for Slam Wrestling. <laughs> I refuse to speak ill of Greg Oliver because he's a great guy, and he and oh, Steve he Johnson have written some some of the best books. And, you know, actually, I, sh- I shouldn't bag on Bret Hart so much, but every time I think of that Hall of Fame uh, appearance where he uh, just ran down Greg Oliver in front of everybody, I just, you know, I, I just got pissed off, and I got even more pissed off when everybody... You know, everybody who wrote about it acted like what Bret Hart did might have been okay, maybe a little overreaction, you know, when he was just being childish. Being a dick. Yeah, but, uh, yes, I do actually have a uh, book review coming on Slam Wrestling pre- probably this coming Wednesday. What's your review? Uh, the uh, Irv Nick Benoit book. Oh. 
Oh, well, I, I know you probably don't want to give away too much of your review, but any anything you would like to comment on it? It's, you know, I had a lot of reservations going in, <laughs> as a lot of people did after what he's been posting on his blog for the last year or so, but there's a lot of good stuff in it. There's a lot of stuff that's kind of a little too weird, but it's, it's, there's a lot of good <laughs> research in it. Anything as weird as the Matthew Randazzo book? <laughs> as far as what, though? Well, the Matthew Randazzo book, while it had a lot of, you know, decent facts in it, it was written like uh, an episode of Geraldo Rivera narrated by a speed racer villain. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not, like, it's not like that, but it has the Irv, like, wordiness in it. You know, the sort of, like, almost like Dennis Miller rant type of, you know, references. Exactly. Which you can burn out quickly on. Yeah. But At least I can. I, I know some people dig it. But, you know, it, uh, yeah, of course I go into more detail in the review, but if you are interested in the subject, it is definitely worth reading. I am very interested in it, and I think when I read Matthew Randazzo's book, you know, I, I was reading a lot of things, and I was reading, okay, how much of this is fact and how much of this is fiction? I mean, there were... There were some things that were way out to lunch, like uh, how much damage taking bumps can you know do to a body, including involuntary ejaculation. <laughs> I, I, oh, uh, but but I kept as I read it, I kept thinking to myself, "There's a really good book to be written here." And Kurt, how often did that happen to you? Involuntary ejaculation? Yeah, only when he was Lucky Pierre. <laughs> exactly. It, it only happened once, right? And, <laughs> and, and it was an accident. Yes, but it was all over Danny Wolf. <laughs> <laughs> I've been having involuntary ejaculation since I was a kid. <laughs> we, we I'm still to... trying to understand it, to be honest with you. <laughs> well, but, but the thing I kept thinking was the you know on the whole Chris Benoit situation. There's a really good book waiting to be written. And I mean, while I'm intrigued with Irv Mushnick one, I know he's gonna, you know, take a you know, a definite hard stance on it and I don't know, you know, for every for every great subject out there there's a lot of malarkey being written and, you know, an occasional great book being written. Yeah. On some level the most interesting thing in the book is an excerpt from a WWE agent report that he somehow got his hands on. Really? Yeah, the whole thing is on the companion DVD of source materials that he's selling, but it's it's very strange to just read about read Fit Finley writing about the weather. I, I had read about this I think once before that the agent reports are like have the like weirdest details because like Vince wants to know you know did you have trouble getting to the building et cetera et cetera, and they write about the weather and all the storms they had to get through. Fascinating. <laughs> Sounds a little weird. Wow. I think I'll wait for the Hulk Hogan book so I can I can live in that fiction. I'm almost scared to think what would happen if Hulk Hogan wrote a book on the Chris Benoit debacle. Oh, that would be awesome. I think that would be pretty good. Like Hulk Hogan, he'd probably blame all the he'd probably blame all the wrestling fans for it or something. <laughs> he'd blame movie. Linda Bollier for it. Yeah, there you go. He'd blame Linda Bollier. And it would be very weird reading about a tragedy where every other sentence has the word brother in it. I wonder if his book's going to have that, like, brother, every every like every like sentence starts with brother, you won't believe it. Yeah, I I would bet money on it. That should well, be like the intro, like the intro, brother, you can't believe what I've been through <laughs> well, in my life you, as a professional wrestler. Well, did you guys hear that threatening voicemail he left that got on the gossip site like a month or two ago? Did he say no, brother? I didn't. Of time? He said brother, and it sounded basically like a Hulk Hogan promo. <laughs> if it didn't say brother, it wasn't Hulk Hogan. Okay. <laughs> that's right. Hey, that's a good, that's a good, uh, you know, ad pitch there. If it doesn't say brother, it's not Hulk Hogan. Oh, there you go. <laughs> See, I'm full of ideas. Look at that. And yeah, I just came up with that one. Now, I, I also understand that another reason why I think Bret Hart might have uh, been defensive about Sky Low Low is I also understand on dark matches where there was no television cameras that he used to steal some of Sky Low Low's spots. He used to, like, run between the referee's leg and jump up and down and 
you know, straddle himself on the ropes and bite the referee on the ass. <laughs> and and I think, wasn't Sky Lolo the one who actually came up with the sharpshooter move? I believe so. It was like the Sky Lolo low shooter or something. Yeah, that's it. That's it. The low shooter, I think. was. Did he it. teach Conan how to do it or did Conan teach him? <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, yeah. Oh my the chicken God. or the egg. The or chicken or the egg. We're, we're, okay. Kurt, did you see that video of Conan screaming at, um, uh, at who was it, Cibernetico? No. They Is this on like, YouTube? Yeah, it was on YouTube. Somebody in Monterey. It happened after, like, I, I guess one of their shows. Wow. And it was supposed to be, like, some sort of shoot thing. But the way it's filmed, <laughs> you could tell it was, like, it, it was somebody right away, some blogger said, no, they, they don't have those type of cameras in, um, <laughs> Monterey, because it looked really good. First of all, look, it look. I mean, when have you ever seen like a security camera look good? Have a good um, video quality. You know, exactly. Looks, oh yeah, looks, I agree. Like, well, it's, it's like whenever I spin the channels nice and show. I see all those so-called reality shows like Scare Tactics and I'm stuff, I'm saying yeah. this is incredibly high quality <laughs> <laughs> so for something I'm supposed to be a, a prank. So they start yelling at each other, and Conan's like being calmed down and. It's just one of those weird videos. So they started making it into like a. I guess now it's part of the angle, where they're where he's putting down Cibernetico as claiming he's a star and everything. But I mean, it's just one of those things where Conan's just going nuts in Mexico for some reason. Did they use oh. each other's real names and say, "And this is a shoot"? <laughs> yeah, I think they're probably going to start with the shoot. Well, I mean, he's he's saying. See, that's the only problem with like what's going on in Mexico. You don't know if it's a shoot or if it's like like a work. Because some of the stuff where he's saying, like he's, you know, talking shit about somebody, it could be like a, like a, you know, something that's a work. But he's going like a little bit over the line where he's starting to call everybody like gay, you know, using gay terms and everything. And that kind of doesn't flow. I, I think they're kind of confused. You can tell like Boxelucci is kind of confused with what, what they're supposed to cover, how they're supposed to cover it. Well, I got to give this to Conan. I think Conan is an intelligent enough person that... He could do something that was a shoot, and if it was ca- caught on camera, I could picture him saying, okay, this was a shoot, but let's start a rumor that it was actually at work. Yeah. I, w- well, then, so I mean, that would actually first? be kind of kind of groundbreaking. Everybody has done the thing where they try to convince people a work is a shoot. But wouldn't that huh. be bitching if you tried to convince people that something that was a shoot was actually a work? So the reverse of a... Ah, yes! There you go. Yes, the inverted, uh, you know, shoot fight. There you go. And so instead of saying, it's a shoot, brother, it's a work, brother. Yeah. <laughs> ah, okay. It's, it's all right, brother. You yeah, know, don't worry, work. everybody. Don't worry, everybody. It's just a work. I mixed up, too. Man, I mixed up now, man. I drank a lot of tea this morning but you know, and this afternoon. It's so confusing because right. even their TV show, like, you don't know who's the... Because now they're doing that whole thing where nobody knows who's the heel and who the face is during shows <laughs> like I mean they're going to cure Wagner no matter what but I mean like one week they'll have like um, goddess on the attacking the baby face and females and then they'll have her turn on them on like her team or whatever and it's like it's like it's becoming I, I mean I feel bad for Cubs fan just keep it up with this stuff <laughs> I think Cubs fan and Dr. Lucha are the only ones who can explain all this stuff nowadays this is true now maybe it's time since Lucha Libre does use the terms Tecnico and Rudo. Maybe it's time to have a third category. Well, I should remember they do have uh, Tecnico Rudos. Yeah, I remember on the IWRG shows on ESPN yeah. in Mexico that they would sometimes say Tecno Rudos. Yeah, it's a Tecnico Rudo. Um, Blue Panther is basically the one who's been known as like that for years. That's he's... cool. I, I did not know that. Kurt, how could you not know this? Well, that's the great thing of you're just getting of just refamiliarizing myself with Lucha Libre is I have all this new stuff to learn. Kurt, you're what was that? Kurt, you're a historian. Yeah, I am. I'm more like I'm a histrionic, but you're in the you're in the historian category of the one Hall of Fame. Come on, <laughs> this is true, and here I am exposing all my uh, inadequacies. You've been exposed. Now, I've been exposed. Gonna... I feel naked. I'm ready to be Lucky Pierre again. I feel naked before all of the world. We can now break the story that you've been exposed. Yeah, we got to get Johnny Legend on the line. If only he knew that we had a podcast, he would be perfect, you know, turning this three-way into a four-way. Then we could get Dr. Lucha on, and we could really get this, you know, thing just going, you know, full five ways, star-pointed. Yeah, I, I, yeah. So what, how many, um, Bix, how many... Uh... Concussions has Nigel had? 
I don't know, but I, I think it was the bicep stuff that kept him, kept WWE from signing him. Chris, did you hear about this? Yeah, yeah, Chris, did you? I, well, this is funny because I, again, I thought my imagination was playing tricks on me because I thought I heard he was going to WWE. So imagine my confusion when I read about him entering TNA. And yeah. so I'm, I'm gonna, I want you guys to fill me in on the whole uh, deal with Nigel. Does, does he have a decent moniker now? Have they filled him in with a new name, even though Nigel McGuinness is already a really cool name? He's either Desmond Wolf or Desmond Hawk in TNA now. Is he debuting today or is it next? He week? debuted at the taping. Oh, is it on tonight? Is it on right now? Uh, I don't know. I'm recording it. Wait, did know. you just say Desmond Hawk? Is yeah, it Desmond, Desmond Hawk, Hawk or Desmond Wolf? Yeah. From Nigel McGuinness. <laughs> yeah. Apparently, he picked out the name himself, though. Well, I'm that, speechless. That should, that, that should teach you any wrestling booker not to let a wrestler pick out his name. Oh, my God. Nigel McGuinness, one of the coolest names. Why not Nigel like something else? Yeah, Nigel. yeah. I, but isn't he, he's English. Well, Nigel, why can't they just go with some... Can't they, like, go through Lockstock and Two, I know, two Barrel? Nigel, Nigel McBudweiser? I don't know. That's the get scary a sponsor. Thing is, get a sponsor and just come up with, like, another nickname. Desmond Hawk. Gee, but man, why don't they do what they do with, with, with what Boxy Lucha or Super Luchas does where they have a contest where people pick out a name? Desmond Hawk. I swear to God. Because so Jumbo McGinnis. <laughs> I love that. Or uh, Go McGinnis. They both got <laughs> their names from contests. <laughs> when you guys first read that, did, were you guys confused? About like when what what was written because I, I mean when I first read it, I thought man Brian or or Dave must be like smoking or something because they man, kept messing up like putting TNA and all this stuff I thought How? I blamed it on myself I just thought well, I'm not remembering my facts correctly so it's kind of refreshing to real you know to realize there was a reason why I was confused no because I, I at first I was like okay he's debuting at the tapings yeah ECW <clears throat> or SmackDown and then they're talking about TNA I'm like TNA what tapings do TNA and then I was like, oh, TNA has tapings also. When is that? Because I don't know. Really TNA, I don't really keep up with. I mean, I don't even know when they have tapings or anything. Neither do I. The most intriguing news I heard was about Awesome Kong beating the shit out of some guy who made a pass at her. That was awesome. Yes. No pun intended. <laughs> she is my second favorite Awesome Kong, though. Who would make a, who would hit on Awesome Kong, though? Kurt Angle. Hey, it's a diverse world out there. Yeah, Kurt Angle, I mean... <laughs> yeah, yeah. If we if we see that Kurt Angle has a black eye tomorrow, we know what happened. <laughs> maybe it's, to, maybe to it's, quote Dave Meltzer, it is very well known that Kurt Angle is attracted to black women. This is true. <laughs> this I is very know, true. And I want to know how bad off though you have to be to fail a WWE physical. Jesus, that is an intriguing question. Especially when you have Edge and all these other guys who are always getting hurt. <laughs> Batista, Batista's always like at least Batista's out like at least twice every year. He's probably going to get injured again on... He literally had like five or six muscle tears. Yeah. <laughs> Which is muscle. another reason why I am forever fascinated with Titanes and El Ring, because there was something that was not just a successful wrestling promotion, but just a huge you know, impact on pop culture, and it was very low impact as far as injury went. You didn't have guys constantly on the injured list or on the drug rehab list. It was very simple. In fact, toward you know the last decade or so, it was really bad in-ring wrestling, but it got over and people paid to see it. And I think there's a lesson to be learned there. Well, this, this seems to be pretty rampant with all the guys who do steroids, though. This is true. I mean, I mean, some of those other guys get hurt all the time when they fall on their heads and they have concussions. But, I mean, it's not as common as as muscle tears for the fifth time having your same, the same muscle tear from your arm or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because Batista, I'm surprised he's still around. I mean... Yeah, I am too. Not that I would expect... I don't know what else he could do with for a living. I mean, Now, like, Bixie, uh, before you called in, we were discussing the Paris Del Mal TV show, and we were wondering, have you had a chance to see it? No. I did hear some of you talking about it, though, but and I am probably going to check it out, though, because I, I read that it has a Cassandro match on it. Yeah. He Cassandro the, rocks. He jumps off some contraption off the, you know, one of those metal type of things. Well, like he did at the balcony yeah. dive at Lucha Boom, yeah. Yeah. yeah and Damn, I, I he has the, more balls than I do. <laughs> I, you know, the only bad thing is, like, I mean, I don't, I don't know how much these guys are getting paid to do that sort of thing, but 
You know, it just seems a little ridiculous now. I don't know. Yeah, I, I would think that at least Luja Vavoon pays well, but... Yeah, I'm not sure about Pro of Mal, though. Especially yeah. working, I think, the third match or something. I think the third or fourth match would be worse. On that note, it appears that I'm going to get a chance to see Super Porky live next month. Really? Do tell. There is going to be a more, you know, traditional type Lucha show in Queens in, in like, the, like exactly a month from now. Uh, with, let me see, actually, someone posted on Death Valley Driver. It's November 22nd, uh, and una, un evento para toda la familia. Um, it's Lucha, you know, Lucha Libre Mexicana. Santo versus Blue Demon Jr. Cassandro versus Aguila de America. Swat Cat versus Bazo Ka. I don't know who that is. Uh, Mascarita Sagrada versus Octagon Cito. Super Porky versus Huracan Ramirez Jr. Please don't ask me which, which one. Local versus local. And that's the card. You, you local versus ask. local. That's an interesting way of advertising. <laughs> Six, if you see Blue Demon Jr., ask him if he saw South Park. <laughs> it looked more like a ray mask, I thought. It, it kind of looked like Blue Demon. It kind of looked like Blue Demon. With the cross too. Except the cross was a little different, I think. Kurt, did you see that? I have not seen it, though I am a huge South Park fan, so I will be on it very soon. They did a, a wrestling-themed show. <laughs> oh, so that already aired. For some reason, I thought that was still up the road. You know, you know, South Park, I mean, there's so many shows, they start at the same time that you kind of forget what's on. I've noticed I, I had that problem with South Park and um, one of these other shows I watched. And I, was, I, I caught that show just because I figured, I thought on um, Death Valley Driver that they were going to be on. And I was like, oh, I've got to yeah. watch that. And it's basically just them doing a play. Just a play of wrestling. Yeah, I've, oh, had the, I've had the same problem as you with forgetting South Park's on for like the first week or so, for like every yeah. six months for the last two years. Yeah, and then the bad thing is they they don't show it till like two weeks afterwards online. Well, no, now it's online the next day. It what is. I find South fascinating about South Park, what I find truly fascinating about South Park is there's so much, you know, crass and gross-out entertainment there, but South Park is one of the few that is not only extremely gross, but extremely funny. And you, as I sit there laughing, I sit there thinking, holy shit, I'm going to hell for laughing at this. I don't even believe in hell, but now I believe hell is being built, especially for whoever laughs at South Park. It is so wrong, but it is so funny. It is so you, brilliant. You, you'll, you'll laugh at that part where they're, um, where they're going to wrestling, they're, they're going to go to a wrestling class. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I, did you ever take wrestling, and, and, and did they ever try teaching you wrestling in um, school? Yes. They, um... They, I guess it's something that that I think you did. They teach you before you learned you learned about the actual pro wrestling, or was this before? Oh no, I knew all about pro wrestling. You know, because there was always a temptation. One thing I remember when I was uh, on the freshman wrestling team in school, one thing we did do is we had an amateur wrestling match just for kicks when the coach uh, wasn't around, and we made it a tag team match. Yeah. See that that happens with all of us. I think because I I even remember when they tried to teach us wrestling when when I was a kid. The first thing we tried to do was like DDTs and suplexes on the <laughs> and and these guys. The, the first thing the the, the professor like okay now you got to get on all fours and the, and the other and then he gets butters to be the did you oh Kurt you got to watch the pimp one. Butters the pimp one pimp. from Lancaster. butters at the pimp. Okay, I'll, I've I got a lot of South was, Park to catch up on also. <laughs> I actually thought that one was a little better than the, the wrestling one. I, yeah. I got so much TV to catch on, catch up on, and it's a terrible thing because TV is the window to the soul when you think <laughs> about it. So you're going to have to talk about your movie. I do have to talk about my movie. Now, Bixie, have you ever heard of a guy named Barry Mahone? Name sounds familiar, but this is probably something you've mentioned to me. <laughs> oh, my God. Now... Okay, here's another question for both of you. Uh, are you guys familiar with the movies of Russ Meyer? Big. I'm not. Russ Meyer was... Of, uh, what's the thing, Mondo Topless or something was one of his? Yeah, movies? Mondo Topless. He was like, in the 60s and 70s, he was like the king of softcore movies. Uh, movies that were light on plot, but full of big, bosomy women. Very ultra-knockout women. They were low-rent but they were 
well filmed. Again, terrible on plot, even for a softcore movie. He's probably most well known for the movie Faster Pussycat Kill Kill. Right. right. Now, as I said, they were very well shot, but it was low rent. Now, Barry Mahone was a low rent version of the low rent Russ Meyer. Mm-hmm. This guy was an absolute trip, and his most fascinating accomplishments had nothing to do with the movies he made. No, 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 I take that back. What he made in the you know cinematic industry is fascinating, but probably not in the way he intended. Before he was a filmmaker, he was a World War II pilot in... Uh, the Royal Air Force. He was, you know, decorated fighter pilot. I think he shot down five German planes, uh, damaged three. He was awarded the British Distinguished Flying Cross in 1985. And let's just say it's a damn good thing that Barry Mahone did not fly fighter planes the way he made films, because if he did, he would have been shot down before he even took off. Now, what makes his film career just so fascinating is it's, you know, started off, he directed a a few few films, you know, called like Cuban Rebel Girls. Um, Oh, here's one I didn't even realize, something called Siempre en la Arena. Wow. Have you watched that? Yeah, I don't know much about it other than the title. Uh, he did a zombie flick called The Dead One, which actually the quality of the zombie in it was not bad for a low-budget movie. And then he did a movie called Rocket Attack USA. But after that, he was obsessed with doing all these very silly nudie flicks. Um, Hollywood Nudes Report, The Adventure of Busty Brown, Roommates, <clears throat> The Art School for Nudists, uh, crazy Wild and Crazy, Hot Skin Cold Cash, Nudes Incorporated, Naughty Nudes, Confessions of a Bad Girl, Nudes on Tiger Reef. So he loved to show, you know, he nudes loved to on what? Nudes on Tiger Reef. What? It was also called Shameless Girls of Tiger Reef. Uh, okay. <laughs> so throughout the 60s, he had all these nudie movies, and the thing that was intriguing about these movies was some of them had a plot, a very bad plot. Uh, They were supposed to be suspenseful when they put you to sleep. But what was really fascinating was he'd have a really cute, perky girl. Perky in what way? Well, you know, maybe they wouldn't look perky in today's world where everybody loves, you know, rock hard knockers and... You know, Not me. <laughs> yeah, and or all these overly uh, uh, puffy lips. But you know, back in the '60s, these were—I mean, I still think they're you know really really cute gals that he used in his movies. But their performances were so uncharismatic and so flat that by the end of the movie, you are tired of watching these girls prance around topless. You know, fully nude. You know, he could make a very sexy woman look dull after a while. <laughs> I I got to admit, I've only seen four or five of these uh, nudie flicks he made. But one thing this guy loved was bad lighting. The lighting was god-awful in these movies. Was he a Lucha Libre promoter? He must have been. I'm convinced. You're right, Fredo. I think I was, was going to say, is he an indie wrestling promoter? So <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. overall, overall wrestling promoter. <laughs> <laughs> he would fit right in with the indie wrestling promotion DVD makers because... Except Pro Wrestling Gorilla and Chikara. The only thing he loved more than that bad lighting, guys, uh-huh. was bad sound. The sound quality on these was horrible. God awful. Are you sure he didn't also promote wrestling under the name Roy Shire? <laughs> <laughs> That's right, and they had canned audiences sound in the background. 
And it's Which studio. is actually a very good point. It's funny because people remember those glory days of Roy Shire, but a lot of them conveniently forget that he had canned audience sound. Well, that was he, after the glory days. He was still drawing pretty good gates back then. Well, yeah, oh, that reminds me. Do you have any of that Kevin Sullivan, Bob Roop stuff? I might have a little bit. I that think that sounded awesome. From the there was some good stuff. Day. I think somewhere I have the match where uh, Bob Root paid Barry Orton to turn on Kevin Sullivan. That I have. That, that yeah. I you probably have the same things I have. I I could almost guarantee. Yeah, because I got it. Uh, it was like a t- uh, Mike Lano put together like a custom tape. For, yeah, that then you and I have the same Lano. the same uh, items. And it has the Dynamite Kid thing. To, like we're yes. in Calgary that they showed on. Okay. Yes, we have the yeah. identical tapes then. Okay. Now this Cadbury Mahone, where he gets really weird and kind of creepy, is after years of making movies like Forbidden Flesh and The Diary of Knockers Macalla. <laughs> he suddenly decides it would be a great idea to make children's movies. Oh boy. Okay. So. He starts off with a movie called Thumbelina, you know, of course, based on the Hans Christian Andersen uh, bit. But the movie that was most talked about that I have yet to see, but I am waiting, you know, I'm really, really ready to see this one. He does a version of Back, Jack and the Beanstalk, and the entire thing is filmed at an abandoned amusement park in Florida called Pirate's World. Now, doesn't that sound like the plot of a Pee Wee Herman movie, <laughs> filming a movie at Pirate World or something. Then, <clears throat> the the movie that took the cake and that I did watch, and I advise everybody to see, is he does a movie called The Wonderful Land of Oz. Oh, boy. And it is a very disturbing... You know, one, I think The Wizard of Oz is disturbing enough in it in it in his greatest glory. But the Wonderful Land of Oz stars his son, Chan Mahone. This was in nineteen sixty nine. And it's about a little kid who just happens to be living with a witch and he plays a practical joke on the witch by creating a man with a pumpkin head and bringing him to life. And uh the witch witch kindly informs him that in a little while she will place a curse on him where I think she'll turn him to stone or something. But it's a good thing she gave him the heads up before actually putting the curse on him because that allowed him and the pumpkin-headed man to escape and go to the land of Oz that was run by the Scarecrow. And the Scarecrow was the king of Oz. And, um, God, how do I put this? The plot gets weirder. There just happens to be a whole troop of... Uh, what's that? It does? Yeah, yeah. It, it, I, 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 there's this group of these teenage go-go girls who decide that they're going to take over the throne and, you know, just punt the scarecrow off and rule Oz. The best part about this movie is it's a musical. Now, remember what I said about the bad sound quality? Uh Mm -hmm. It would be like if you and I picked up a camcorder back when camcorders were a luxury and almost nobody had one and said, let's make a movie. We'll shoot it inside. (laughs) There'll be no boom mics, no microphones, no nothing. So this was like a very disturbing kitty flick in badly lit color. It is like you drop the acid, and then you drank a bottle of NyQuil on top of it, and then you thought, what would happen if I take a couple of Quaaludes just for a kicker? And this cat, Barry Mahone, also went to write and direct an animated flick, which you guys might have seen, called Santa and the Three Bears. It sounds familiar. Yeah, it actually had a pretty big theatrical release when I was a kid. And even as a child, I thought there's something wrong with Santa, you know, cohabitating with three bears. Almost like uh, Harlem Globetrotters and Snow White. Bingo. Bingo. Exactly. Now, 
Santa, the Bre- Three Bears, and the Harlem Globetrotters meet Snow White. I would like that. Okay, maybe I'll become a film director. Maybe I'll become a film producer. Yeah, the beautiful thing about uh, Kurt, The you, Wonderful yeah. Land of Oz and Jack and the Beanstalk is it is available on Something Weird Video. You can get it off Amazon.com. This is truly the most repulsive cinema I have ever seen. The films of the Barry Mahone make Ed Wood's work like look like Apocalypse Now or Satyricon. This, I mean, Ed Wood has no more bragging rights as the worst filmmaker in history. Barry Mahone, decorated World War II pilot. Oh, I forgot to add, he was also a prisoner of war, and I don't know whether this is urban legend or not, but it's a legend that uh, the Steve McQueen character in the movie The Great Escape was loosely based on his experiences. There might be some truth to it, because before he was a director, he hung with the Hollywood crowd and actually managed Errol Flynn's career for a brief period. How that happened, I don't know. If Steve McQueen hadn't died... There would have been a part two to that movie where he directs really crappy films <laughs> after escaping. Oh, my God, that would be that would be it perfect. It could have been a pretty good film, you know. <laughs> what could be more poetic? Especially with what? McQueen, I mean, jeez. Okay, oh, anybody, the- else there, out, anybody else out there named McQueen who could we have starring as Barry Mahone? Because, <laughs> I mean, it would make as much sense just finding any cat whose name is McQueen. Well, I think his, either like his son or his grandson is, act, is an actor. I forget. It's like Steve R. McQueen. Okay, okay. Bixie, Fredo. Grandson, and, I guess. Well, wait, when did he die? He died in 1980. That was when he had cancer and was doing experimental treatments in Mexico. Yeah, so maybe grandson. He was on... Everwood is like a gay piano student. Okay, Bixie, Fredo, and I are going to start writing the script on the based on the life of Barry Mahone post World War II. We don't know how he came to direct all these really boring nudie flicks. And again, that's no uh, disrespect to the women who were in these flicks because they were cute gals. But boy, this guy did not know how to make a film. <laughs> Sounded like a much more fascinating person than he was a director. Could have Barry Mahone ever? book a wrestling promotion he would be the perfect person to do it in fact man maybe we should is he still alive you know he was based in california so maybe if we go to the athletic commission files and look up old promoter licenses i would not be shocked to find him there he would be no more far-fetched than the legendary promoters like joe palumbo who did you know california championship wrestling maybe he came back as vince russo Judging from what Vince Russo... Well, actually, Vince Russo hasn't done anything that... Barry Mahone never died. Tom Ernesto. What's that? I was going to say Tom Ernesto, that maybe he was Tom Ernesto's ghost booker. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Because Vince Russo, I mean, even some of his stuff isn't as good as some of that crappy. <laughs> God, other, other great questions here. What if Tom Ernesto and Vince Russo met? Well, Tom that- Ernesto had some good ideas. He did, you know, and he gets a he gets a lot of crap because he booked some terrible sequences in Los Angeles when it was dying. But in his defense, the Los Angeles territory was dying anyway, and who knows? Maybe he was just having fun. I don't know. <laughs> oh, I, I heard he actually did some cool uh, booking in Puerto Rico and Tennessee. Oh, speaking of the Los Angeles territory, I can't believe I didn't email you about this earlier. Um, I was looking over Vern Siebert's tape site the other day, and I have no idea how I never knew about this before, but he had film of the Monsel Powder angle. Really? Yes. I mean, I know Vern. I know he's telling the truth. Not sure if it's a fan who happened to have a camera in the studio or was shooting it at his TV, but he has film of it. I'm going to procure it. I wouldn't be shocked if it was a fan who had a camera because I don't know. I, I was told who it was, and memory escapes me, but there w- were some fans who did a lot of uh, home movies, like got their little uh, Super 8 movie cameras into the Olympic Auditorium. Oh, my! are, are you going to get a copy of it? Yes, I will. Please hook me up. You <laughs> Well, you already have a friend for life, but I'll be a super <laughs> friend for life. I was amazed. That, I, I that's like amazing. It. The I only thing I've seen is a photo of Tolis throwing the powder in the face. I, I don't know if you guys have seen that. 
I know there's better a, than there's nothing because I mean I would like to hear the Dick Lane commentary because everyone talks about always talks about how great that was. But Dick Lane was amazing. It's funny I saw um, I saw two segments of Dick Lane comment you know doing commentary on wrestling from the late fifties and early sixties. One was in a gorgeous George match versus Lee Grable. The other was. Uh, Freddie Blassie versus Ricky Dawson at the Olympic, which I think a lot of people have seen. And I can tell you, uh, Dick Lane got better with age because the commentary he did on Channel 13 in the early 70s was twice as good as those, you know, those two previous matches I mentioned. <clears throat> Dick Lane just had this enthusiasm, this firecracker, char- charismatic voice. I've said this before. He, if he looked at you and smiled and said, we've got great news, there's a colony of lepers coming to infest your house next week, you would be excited and you'd be breaking, baking brownies and making coffee for them, saying, oh boy, I'm going to be infected. <laughs> I mean, he was that good. You you could have a god-awful match on TV and he would he would sell it. Dick Lane was unlike anybody. And top that off with having Jimmy Lennon Sr., the absolute finest ring announcer in history. No disrespect to Howard Finkel, who was great. And I've, I've heard a few people say that Howard Finkel was better than Lennon, who saw both in action. And I, I so, so disagree with that. Lennon ruled. Jimmy Lennon was just amazing. And But Dick Lane's commentary, he was three-quarters of the reason to watch L.A. wrestling. There, there were periods where, you know, there was a few really good workers, a bunch of mediocre workers. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. Dick Lane really sold that show. And even though in later years Gene LaBelle made a god-awful wrestling commentator after Dick Lane retired, but Gene LaBelle was great in the role as the ringside interviewer after each match. I mean, he was campy, he was over-the-top, but... Uh, you know, <laughs> it was it was like a, a post Gold Dust trio, not in promoters, but in you know the presentation on TV. Dick Lane, Jimmy Lennon, and Judo Gene LaBelle. That was some of the best wrestling television ever. I need to hear your impression of Gene LaBelle saying "Wow" again. <laughs> wow! <laughs> there we go. <laughs> oh. oh, his comment and his commentary in later years was so bad. It was. I mean, I wouldn't say I would love tapes of it, but just it was bad in memory. It's amusing. I mean, the things he would say, like, this wrestler, CB Rex Arnold, he has CBs everywhere. He has them in his house wrestling fans. He has them in his car, and I think he might even have CBs in his wrestling trunks. Wow! And <laughs> <laughs> but, oh, he, I, I remember the first time I heard him say, wow, it was when uh, Kinji Shibuya and Masa Saito were the, you know, Japanese heels. And there was a match where Kinji Shibuya was trouncing some jobber, and Ernie Ladd, who was the top heel of, for, of the moment, comes to ringside to give him advice how to work his match, and Shibuya just looks at him, you know, you know with this nasty look and says, get the hell out of here, I don't need your help. And, you know, you can see what's coming a mile away, but when you're 10 years old and you've never seen a heel turn baby face, you know, which was, you know, my situation, it was damn exciting. And the two of them start brawling at ringside in the TV studio. And then Gene LaBelle, you know, just comes there looking astonished with his eyes wide, you know, in his his tomato red suit and his tomato red hair. And he's saying, Kenji Shibuya, what, whatever is going on? And Shibuya was like, hey, if I need any help, I can go to my cousin Masa Saito. I don't need this, you know, this rat Ernie lad telling me what to do. And, you know, issues a challenge. And then Gino Bell just looks at the camera and pauses and then just screams, wow! <laughs> it was beautiful. It it don't get more bitchin' than that. All the TV production in, you know, the present TV age cannot outdo the beauty of TV studio wrestling. By the way, uh, Nigel McGuinness is on this episode of TNA. Oh, he is? Okay. I'll probably watch Desmond? It. Yeah, Desmond I did. They didn't, there's no graphic, and I'm, I have it on mute. So, but, um, oh, you didn't hear the name? The name? 
No. Was Desmond Hawk. I'm sure we'll How find out. How about Archbishop Desmond, Desmond Hawk? I don't know. <laughs> It was silent. We disagree. Oh, hey, I thought I came up with something brilliant, but I guess not. I guess I'm, I guess I'm the Tom Ernesto of the moment. <laughs> I'm just, it's just, it's just, and of course he's working against Kurt Angle, who's another guy who's <laughs> been through all that situation, all the injury bug too. Yeah, I was going to hey, say he's going to be physical. Yes. Yeah. Hey, let's change Kurt Angle's name while we're at it too. Kirk, Kirk Angle. Yeah. Angle? <laughs> or we're, we're I like it. Kirk, Kirk Angel, or what did, what did um, Jericho call him once? Kirk Angel. Yeah, Angel. <laughs> that, that was always one of the funnier ones. Hey, Kurt, did you ever, did you did you get a chance to hear Paul Heyman? Yeah, oh my God. Anybody who doesn't subscribe to the Figure Four website, you are a fool if you do not subscribe, because the Paul Heyman interview is one of the best podcasts I have ever heard in my life. Just and listening course- to Paul Heyman... One, it's great to hear Paul Heyman refer to himself as a con man. I love how <laughs> candid he is. <laughs> Plus, course, man. The other thing that we found fascinating was him bringing up um, Brian sounding like Dr. Demento. Yes. Yes, <laughs> Bixie, are you familiar with the good Dr. Demento? I don't know if I've ever heard the show, so I don't think I've actually heard his voice. I like, might have heard like the collect- one of his CD collections of the songs, but not his voice. He, I don't. Does he still have some sort of a... Radio show or podcast in existence because I think he has a does. website. He has a website. I don't know if it's if he's doing it. I think he's still doing it though. Like I think he has a, bot, a podcast though. Yeah, it was actually a high point in you know radio broadcasting here in Southern California. Every Sunday night, Doctor Demento would air live. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was from seven o'clock to ten p.m. on Sunday nights, and they would uh, have a top ten countdown of just weird and bizarre songs. You know, as selected by the radio audience. And here's a trivia question: Does anybody know which song stayed at number one longer than any other in Doctor Demento's history? I'm gonna guess Pencil Neck Geek. Exactly, exactly. It stayed at number one for the longest time. And Doctor Demento, the, my own, my only personal interaction with Doctor Demento was that when uh, Moon Dog Main passed away. Uh, maybe a month before, Dr. Demento was a special guest at the Olympic Auditorium when Freddie Blassie was feuding with Moondog Maine. And after Moondog Maine passed away, I wrote Dr. Demento asking him if he had the song The Ballad of Moondog Maine, which was written by a rockabilly singer who uh, you know, released the single under the name Ricky Ringside. And that be a certain Mr. Margulies? Uh, no, but he is a friend of Mr. Margulies. Okay. Uh, in fact, that's what, you know, I, the name's escaping me, but Johnny Legend actually knows the fellow who wrote the song. He's a fellow out of Texas. And uh, I believe it or not, I have the single autographed by Ricky Ringside. Wow. <laughs> but I wrote Dr. Demento just asking if he had it and if he could play it, and I was shocked that less than a week later, I actually got a personal response from Dr. Demento talking about seeing Moondog mainly at the Olympic Auditorium, you know, sorry to hear about his passing, and I was like, whoa. And as it turns out, apparently he was, like, almost obsessive about answering all his fan mail personally. As opposed to us, who we don't answer a lot of ours. <laughs> yeah, we just but, give know. one big, uh, uh, you know, anonymous uh, hello over the podcast to the dozens of people who listen to us. You gotta digitize that single. I gotta hear that. Yeah, sir. You gotta put that on the internet. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I guess I gotta get my turntable out and get it digitalized. And <laughs> you're gonna. Oh, you gotta. It's on. It's a record. You yeah, it's a little that. forty-five. It's uh. <laughs> to be honest, it's not much of a song. It's just like I can remember some of the lyrics, and it goes something like, uh, "And when he's out there wrestling, they say, go moon doggy, go." I wonder if he's a crab head. tree, Arkansas wrestling, her row, and then the chorus is, "This is the ballad of Moondog Maine. This is the ballad of Moondog Moon Maine. Maine." So, play online. <laughs> probably recorded it in a few hours. Uh, probably oh, wrote um, it in a few minutes. If you put it online, I promise to upload the King Curtis Hawaii interviews that I have on CD. Oh, okay. Oh, there's a deal there. There's a deal there. 
time to dust off the turntable. I don't think I've played my turntable in like 10 years, so... It's going to break. You better be careful. <laughs> or you'll, you'll, oh, pass, you'll pass out from all the dust. <laughs> yeah, you. I know. I don't want to breathe that in. Yeah. Reminds me, I want to got to get that Memphis photo book that came out that has the bonus CD with like the Jackie Farco and Lynn Ross, Rossi singles on them. That's uh, the one that just got released, right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, there's a book to pull. There's so much I want to buy. I would, I want to pick that one up. Um, Gary Hart. The Gary Hart one I want to read. I still haven't read J.J. Dillon's book. There's so much great wrestling literature out there, and and yeah, <laughs> and then there's Hulk Hogan. <laughs> yeah, the Hulk Hogan book. Don't forget. God, that. I, I just I just can't get over. It. Do you realize that it's already at like the one thousand uh, the one thousand mark on Amazon dot com? The Hulk Hogan book. Yeah, it, 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 of all books. Yeah, of all books. Okay. And, and then I think I out. checked on the Benoit one, and it's something like in the two thousand range. And okay, and then the Rey Mysterio pre-sales are at thirty-six thousand. I mean, I know I'm reading too much. Into they this. change it every moment. I never this get why Dave makes lists of them, but I think it's fixed. Well, he stopped with that though. I think it, I think it's a work that list. Probably, I mean, <laughs> hell, when you have a, when you have somebody like Bill O'Reilly on the top ten, you're wondering. Please tell me it's work. Please tell me not all of America is reading all these morons who uh, you know write so-called memoirs or political commentary. Well, yeah, I've had works. that explained to me, the O'Reilly and Fox News thing, that I, and I believe it's based on actual, like, unbiased Nielsen polling. It is not that it's, that... it's that these people who watch Fox News and stuff are so into it. It's, that's, what, that's what I had heard. I, I you know... And I'd wondered if that's the case, if they're just really vocal. If the audience is so into it that they are going to buy all these books and stuff, and that, like, you know, that the people who watch Fox News or listen to the conservative station, you know, conservative talk-based radio stations, they listen to or watch it all day. And they believe it. Right, but the point is, as far as the sample size, it's, it's the, I, these people are watching it all day, and that it's not, I, this isn't, I swear, this is not a conspiracy. I, you could probably look it up somewhere, but my dad told me about it since he works in TV research. Mm-hmm. But they, it, it, that's how, that's what, where, sort of where their good numbers come from, to a degree. So it's kind of like the equivalent, almost, of like, like a, a, a cult audience, in a sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Golf, no pun intended there. Yeah. <laughs> or wrestling fans. Yep, yep. God bless us. <laughs> God bless us, Nelly wrestling fans. By the way, um, you guys are going to Cauliflower Alley in April, right? I am definitely going. Okay. And I think Dr. Luch is going. Said he was going. Are you going, Dixie? I've been thinking about it now because I'm looking it up and it's not that expensive to go to Vegas. And oh, the- you should go. It It is a blast. And the, I see, like that, they have a very cheap deal at the hotel that the that they have. I don't know if it's a good hotel or not. <laughs> that doesn't matter. It's Vegas. That's true. But uh, and I think I think like because I know they went to like I know Rob Naylor and Chris Hero were going. So I figure with you guys going too, it probably would be a good time. Uh, well, I'm I'm definitely going to go because uh, I have I I'm pretty certain Ed Moretti's going to go, and I haven't seen him in four or five years. Miss him big time and. Uh, who else? Tom Burke's going to go. A lot of people I've known for years are going, so I definitely want to make. I, the only reason I didn't go this past year is just because I had uh, just, you know, gotten over my lymphoma, and I burned all, you know, more than all my hours at work. And but man, I was bummed I couldn't go. So next year is going to be definite. So Alfredo, are you going with us? You know me. I don't plan that ahead of the time. <laughs> Uh, I take that as a yes. You know, you now know, I'm gonna I'll, have to. I'll, I'll give you a yes, but then you know, by the time it gets around, I'll be like, oh, I don't know if I can make it. Ah, you'll go. You'll be able to make. It. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Here's the thing. I'll have to definitely twist Dan Farron's arm. Uh huh. Um, and if he goes, I bet Mary Lou will go. And Johnny Legend, several on several occasions, called me to ask if he could catch a ride to Cauliflower Alley. The only problem was. Uh-huh. I was already halfway to Vegas. Oh, God. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's our dear Johnny. He waits to the last minute. So, so then my last minute isn't as bad as his last minute. Technically. Not, oh, God. Yeah. Not even close, man. No, no, no. You're, you're I, a guy who plans ahead of time in that yeah, respect. Yeah, mine is like a week. 
Yep, Ricky Ataki makes it here. So here's my hmm, here's my plan, guys. Dixie, yeah. you should fly into California. Mm-hmm. We should rent like a huge van and have a whole caravan. It would be, you know, like a delusional version of the, you know, Ken Kesey or the Merry Pranksters or something like that. Are you offering to host me at your humble abode? Damn straight, yes. That sounds good. Oh, damn. This is going to be bitching. So bitching. It don't get more bitching than that. Now, by the, way, by the way, why is it during the week and not on the weekend? Uh, oh, is it going to be during the week again? This Yeah, it's mon- like yeah, Monday through Wednesday. Uh, because they're insane. They're involved in wrestling, and everybody involved in wrestling makes no sense. Hey, it's like, yeah, but they think it's like going, going around the loop. Kurt. You know yeah. who just said that on, on a promo right now on TNA? Scott Steiner. He was talking about uh, Kurt Angle, and he goes, he goes, anybody who's in wrestling is crazy. <laughs> I think it, Whoa, it like, oh my God, like that's, that, that's kind of wigging me out that that there's some sort of symbiotic connection between... Between you and Scott Steiner. Yes, holy shit. <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> Kurt, we got to keep you away from uh, Rob Naylor, though. I don't think, we'll, I don't think we'll, our conversation. I think you'll, you'll, you guys will hog the conversation. Are you? Oh, dear, no, that dear. would be the best thing ever. I know. I think we should just film that. Kurt and Rob Naylor in the same room. <laughs> Rob Naylor, Kurt Brown in the same room, to, and just give them throw topics at them. Like, hey, what do you guys think of midgets? And just have a now, 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 the now okay. The midgets. Here's another thing where I have catching up to do. Rob Naylor. Oh, he's a he's an internet guy. He's a yeah, you know, friend of mine. Done a bunch of podcasts together on my thing, and also when on when the Joe versus the World show was going on, we did shows about global and Savoldi together. And he, he's done a bunch of podcasts. Yeah, he's, he's really funny. Yeah, you got. I, okay, I have to check this guy out. I, I, well, I, I don't. I, I probably said this, you know, several I've times heard. already over the course of since we started doing Slam and Stand. But one of the beautiful jobs about being a filing clerk is. I'm in a room with only two other people, so the three of us have headphones on all day, and I think they listen to music or books on tape, and I listen to podcasts all day long. It, it, I, it, I, you know, anything from wrestling podcasts to Surf Guitar 101, which is one of the most bitchin' podcasts out there, as well as MailOrderZombie.com. Kurt, Kurt, the best way to describe Rob Naylor is like if you had a a a, a, a brother who you'd never met, it would probably be Rob Naylor. Lord, okay, and he is going to cow- cauliflower next year. Yeah, yeah, I think he. Is. I know he went this year. I know he went. He went with Chris Hero. So awesome, awesome. Well, provided, yeah, well, provide, you know, well, that that's my proposition. We'll see if it works out where we could start from California, all of us together, and head in a van up there to Vegas. Uh, worst case scenario, we'll all fly and meet at Vegas. Vegas, but we got to make it to CAC, guys. Something, this would be like the ultimate convention. Something funny though about Naylor, because I don't know if you've seen his Facebook or anything, that he like he's sort of like if you had a tiny, like tiny, like tiny brother who's like twenty years, like like a no, not, you're not twenty years older than him. But, <laughs> <laughs> so, but um, so that one when we, we were at the ROH Kabashi show and like we're talking after the show, and someone goes up to the guy to uh, to someone else that we know, and he's like. Is that his little brother? <laughs> Rob's a, like Rob's a tiny guy, and, and but he's like he's like eight years older than me or something. But um, inter- okay, okay. I'm on Facebook right now, and I looked up Rob Naylor. Yes. I see a guy giving a peace sign. Yeah, I think that's him in a red shirt. Okay, I'm in putting, Pennsylvania. Um, it doesn't say. I'm adding him on my friend list right now. <laughs> And we'll see if he accepts accepts me. If he doesn't accept me, then maybe I have to kind of like do a little uh, self uh, self analysis here. <laughs> anyway, let me make sure. Let me see what his uh, picture it's is. It's got to be the only other Rob Naylor's here. Is some yeah, guy that, the red shirt. Yeah, the only other Rob Naylor's here is I see some guy with tattoos. Another guy yeah. standing at the mouth of a cave, <laughs> and some statue guy in a blurry photo. There's it could be all him, can it? Does he have a brother named Tiny? I don't know, but no, but that's him. He's fine. Okay, cool, cool. That is now. Oh God, man, there's there's so I'm many cool things. I've never to... heard him, Kurt. He's he's like on a bunch of different shows. I have heard the name, but I did. You, yeah. I've never known a thing about him. There's yeah. a lot of names I've heard that I, uh, you know, people 
hanging around the wrestling scene that I don't know that much about. I would say for the best introduction to the world of Rob Naylor, you should listen to the show I did with him about Samoans. Oh, really? Okay. I'm there. I'll be downloading that as soon as we're off here. <laughs> and here, oh, here's another interesting thing. Have either of you used to uh, troll around on the Kayfabe Memories site? Yes. Yeah. Is it down? It's been down for several days now. It says yeah. bandwidth limit exceeded. Oh, the main site or the board? Uh, the the oh, main oh, site. Oh, I don't even go there anymore, but I think like a lot of stuff went off the main site. Yeah, I would. Are you trying to get the message board? Uh, well, that's why that's what I was going to do. I usually go, you know, through the main board, and it's it was up up until a few weeks ago. And the message board's still up. The main site is not. Okay, gotcha. Because it's on a different server. Okay. Oh, oh man, the internet is a whole new wonderful world. I guess it's not new. Figure out how to get back on the the message board. Because usually when you get on the message board, isn't there that um that um that advisory or whatever that? Oh yeah, like you have warning. to read all that stuff and pretend like you're paying attention. Yeah, to like it. hey, don't do that. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, have okay. Yeah. You know that's the bad thing about message boards. It, I, I it's it's not that that's really not the biggest problem. The biggest problem is the spam. The spam accounts that keep popping up on those message boards. Yeah. The spam and all the crazy people. I mean, I, I, no, seriously. Wait, not not just the spam that shows up. The stuff you have to remove. Like if you're an, if you're a moderator, or oh or really? Those, you just gotta get like it's ridiculous. I, I was getting like twenty five to thirty spam accounts every day, and I was like, man, this is yeah. Ridiculous. Well, I, yeah. There's very few message boards I go on to for any subject, not just wrestling, because yeah. it just it just confirms my prognosis on the world is. The only problem with the world is that there are too many nuts in it. There are just way too many nuts in this world. The the cure, I have no clue. I just know the prognosis. That's it. So was that all you wanted to know about KK memories? <laughs> yeah, I was just curious. It, just, it was just off the top of my head. Yeah, they, you know. That there was like a problem or something? Like some sort of argument? No, nah, nah, just just problem accessing. I know there's always an argument. If you go to that wrestling... Uh, what is it? Is it the Wrestling Classics board where you know there are several nut jobs who actually think that the era of Luthez is going to return? <laughs> Not Luthez himself, but... No, but the guy with, like the guy with the signature that says, Ref, uh, uh, wrestling doesn't seem as good now because Mr. Thez spoiled us. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. You know, Luthez, I mean, <laughs> if you ever notice, search everywhere you want to go, but you can never find evidence of Luthez wrestling in Argentina. We all know why. He was afraid of the um, forearm the mummy. Smash. He no, was, was afraid gonna... of La Momia. Oh, okay. I was going to. He say knew. He knew. I, yeah, he could shoot with most of them, but a mummy? No, no. He was afraid of mummies. That's my. Or, I bet he's afraid of monsters in general. That's. Yeah, but no, there's people on some of these message boards who actually think it's going to go back to the old days where they all wear wool tights and, you know, do these polite hold-for-hold hold matches and, you know. Wrestling Classics. Yeah, wrestling, to, to make you have missed some strange stuff at Wrestling Classics over the years. <laughs> like yeah, there's, yeah. There's, I mean, there's something like with, with what you're talking about, there was a thread where someone asked about Lynn Denton being on Nitro and getting squashed by Goldberg randomly. And then there are all these people talking about Man, Len Zen was so good, though. He's too, you know, he's old school. Why are they having him get squashed by Goldberg? And people are like, man, Len, Len Zen was good, but this was 1998. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And you, you, if you went to everybody in that arena and said, who's Len Denton, they'll, they'd probably all say, uh, is he a car, sale, car salesman on TV or something? Uh, you know. Now, by the way, do you know about the most WCW match in the history of WCW? No. Involving Len Denton? I have not seen it myself, but on an episode of Worldwide, there is Lynn Denton versus Atlantis. You're kidding me. No. Was that the one where they call him Lee's Mark? Uh, yeah, I forget if that's the one or the one he had with Emilio Charlie. I would love to see that. Yeah. I get that. I, that's, the, that's probably what I miss more about WCW than anything else. You know, yeah, like, I mean, that, I mean, I would actually love to see that because I mean, I know it would be a clashing of styles, but you got this great old school worker with this great luchador. I mean, <laughs> I'd love to see it just to say I saw it. Yeah, maybe I'll try to get it from Steve Friedlander or somebody. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, all that stuff. You know, like Super Astro doing a run in and then never wrestling. 
Oh, that one. I, I, in fact, yeah. I also Bob remember the only time I saw Super Astro on WCW was that god awful uh, Lucha Battle Royal where the Giant well, was a run did the run in. It, it, it was a run in because it, it was, started off as um, like an like an interview, wasn't it? With somebody doing an interview. Yeah, it was like an impromptu battle <laughs> royal. Yeah, and battle then everybody royal. started showing up to issue a challenge to the champ, and then they just created a battle royal, and everybody was just flying out of the ring. And I remember Mike Tanay even mentioned something about Super Astro, and Bobby Heenan said something like, Super who? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's the funny thing. Like Everybody assumes that like Bobby Heenan and Larry Zbysko would hate all, wouldn't really get into Lucha, and they were like, they actually kind of like some of that stuff. And, that's like, Larry cool. Larry Zbysko actually does like Lucha, which I, I was kind of surprised to hear about. I, don't know. I, I blame Shivani more, you know, especially for the commentary for the... Mexican hardcore match. <laughs> I blame I blame them. whoever came up with the hardcore title in the first place. I mean, I think oh, their ridiculous. hardcore title. I think well, was ridiculous. Well, if I ever do anything booking wise with Incredibly Strange again, I'm going to debut the uh, the softcore match. You you can't use a fist. Yeah, uh, you can use foreign objects, but they all have to be made of foam, and no penetration. No penetration, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, Kurt, you're not going to be able to be in the match. Yeah, I know. Damn it. I'm booking it's something I can't even participate in. God damn it. Oh, by the way, because I think Jose mentioned this a long time ago. Did you and uh, Johnny Legend ever win or come close to winning Worst Promotion or something in The Observer? Yeah, they oh. were proud of it or something. Oh, yeah. yeah I, Worst Bookers. It was the Booker. p- pinnacle. It was the pinnacle of my wrestling career. We came in fifth place in the most disgusting oh, yeah. promotional tactic. For what, Cletus Fita? No, for the incredibly strange wrestling period. Really? <laughs> I, I was so, oh man, I was so happy. It, it, it got even better. Somebody even wrote this long letter asking Dave not to cover incredibly strange wrestling. I, man, I, I, I got to dig it up because they they just said how disgraceful it is. They, and I, Kurt, didn't Dave post that letter on the... He did put it on the, reader, the reader's pages, right? Yes, he did. Because I remember you told me that. You, I think you might have shown it to me, actually. And I, I remember writing a... Uh, I remember writing a response just, you know, saying something like, like, yeah, we are disgraceful and like... Yeah, can't, why can't we go back to the good old days of, like, you know, straight wrestling where uh, the Sheik throws fire and we have the McGuire twin, you know, twins doing chain wrestling and... The Lars, the Lars Anderson robot. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Whatever happened to those good old days of wrestling that never... I almost really said existed. Lars Von Erich. What's that? I almost said Lars Von Erich. Lars Von Erich! Wait! <laughs> that, that's that's what, ha- what happened if Lars Anderson and... And Fritz von Erich had a kid. If they had a kid, yeah. <laughs> Lars, Lars von Erich. Oh, Lord. Yeah, no, but that... Uh, oh, man, I was grinning to ear from ear, and Johnny was even happier. I mean, Johnny was on cloud nine. I mean, he had finally made it. Uh, I mean, he had been talking years before Incredibly Strange Wrestling. He and several other people fantasized about doing something along those lines, and... When they started airing Titanes and El Ring for the second round in 1981, Johnny was just like flabbergasted and just said, "This guy is the greatest genius in in wrestling history." What year, what year was this, by the way? What year awards? Uh, it the year Incredibly Strange Wrestling started was in 1995, so it, it was for that year. Okay, so let's see what won that year. Was that the year that um, Rob Feinstein started booking, bomb, bootlegging all your stuff? Oh yes, yes. <laughs> That's where I first heard about incredibly strange wrestling. Yeah, on his, um, I think it, maybe I think I I'm not sure if it was that or the torch. I remember but, it on on um, Feinstein's um, update. Okay. <laughs> oh, by the way, the okay. winner that year was uh, Gene Okerlund's 900 number advertisement. <laughs> oh, that was was that when Crusher Blackwell died and he tried to. Hint that Ric Flair died or something like that. Yeah, he hinted it was Flair or Backlund by saying it was a forty-something former world champion. That's right, I remember that. Well, I don't mind coming in fifth place. I mean, just being in the running at all, just 
I mean, there's nothing more I was going to accomplish as an indie star. <laughs> indie star? What am I saying? An indie geek? <laughs> oh, I was never a star. <laughs> you know, I miss I miss the good old hotline. No, hotline yeah. in general. Talk about something of of an era past. Although I wouldn't pay to hear them, but I mean, <laughs> uh, I re- I remember like. The there was like the Albano and Bruno trivia hotline with Coach Kurt, maybe, uh-huh. and to win prizes and stuff. And years later, I somehow got an 800 number backdoor for it. Oh no way! <laughs> no, but like I don't know why it was still there. <laughs> this was years later, right? <laughs> yeah, like years, several years later. This would it probably like from like at least five years later. So you were getting all the news from 1990. <laughs> well, that was it. Was a trivia hotline, though. It wasn't a news yeah. hotline. And I actually, I remember though. I remember reading like people would like say though that Dave and Wade would give out their eight hundred number back doors to like wrestlers and to to, uh, to gain their trust or something. <laughs> oh, that wouldn't shock me, or just as a favor and that kind of thing, you know. <laughs> there used to be so many though. I mean, in New York though, like mm-hmm. had a lot. Like, we well, we had also had we would have people who would set up like. I don't know if it was their voicemail or they set up something though. There would be a lot of local call hotlines, and there, you know, there was also we had. It's probably in a lot of parts of the country. You ever heard of Talking Yellow Book? <laughs> Talking Yellow Book. It was. It would be this local call thing that would, you know, have all these different pre-recorded messages about things, and one was wrestling news. Wow, interesting. And I don't, you know, it was weird, but like. Not long before it disappeared, you'd have different people reading the same update at different times in the week. Interesting. You know, going you know, going back to Heyman, you know, when you're talking about just days past of wrestling, one of the reasons I I encourage everybody to listen to the Paul Heyman interview is, man, he paints a picture of New York wrestling back in the seventies with with such flair and such. I mean, he paints such a picture that you wish you could be there and experience it. When he talks about hanging out with uh, Albano and everybody at the Blarney Stone, um, man, I, I wish I had the narrative style of Paul Heyman or something like message. it. I mean, yeah. he really, he really just illustrated, you know, the, the, not just the wrestling scene in New York, but the, you know, the scene of, you know, the fans and the hangers on and stuff like that. It, it, it you know it's one of those interviews you got to go out of your way to listen to. Oh, that reminds me. I know he at least was a to some degree was a photographer, and I think he mentioned in his Albano column that he even got a photo pass just to be a hanger on before that. But and I'm going to guess it's not true, but I want to make sure. In Downtown Bruno's book, he claims that Paulie got ahead in the wrestling business by having his dad either buy a wrestling magazine or start one and then write favorable stuff about people. That's not true, right? And I never heard about that. The only thing I remember is I remember I was really into the the newsletter scene back in 79 and 80. And what I remember is, that, man, there were tons of newsletters from the East Coast. Um, some of them pretty good. I mean, there was uh, Mike O'Hara's um, uh, Bill Hill put out a really cool sheet for its time called Empire State Wrestling. Mm-hmm. Who else? Rocco Budafoco, uh, uh My personal favorite, Captain Lenny's Wrestling Journal. I wish I saved a copy just because if I described it to you, you wouldn't believe me that such a newsletter existed. Um, but Paul Heyman, uh, who nobody really heard much of before, started putting out a newsletter and I never actually saw a copy myself, but apparently it was way out, and he'd print fake interviews and stuff like that. Um, I know some of the interviews were legit, but some of them were not. But the thing I remember is everybody was jealous. As, man, jealous as all hell, because this um, kid who was putting out this like way out newsletter had access to all the wrestlers and... You know, would be, <laughs> there are pictures of him hanging out with the Grand Wizard Lou Albano and Freddie Blassie, and he, po- he posted that in the blog about Albano. He posted that picture with his sister. Yes, wife. yes, and all the other newsletter writers, you know, uh, were you know they did all the you know things that you know by unwritten rule you're supposed to do about you know 
you know, being respectful for, towards the promotion and kayfaving and all this good stuff. And, and here's this kid who's breaking all the rules, and he's the one getting access to the wrestlers. And, oh, man, they were pissed. They hated him for that. And they, were, they would, you know, they spread all these rumors that the only reason he got to all the wrestlers is because he was a drug dealer and, you know, he was selling them heroin and that kind of thing. And Not the first time it happened in his career. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. No, I don't. <laughs> I don't put anything past anybody. But it's just, it's just. You know, I I can't remember who was even saying it. Somebody says, yeah, it's only because he sells drugs to the wrestlers. And I said, he does. Well, how did you find that out? And the person just kind of stammers. Well, you know, uh, I just know. That's all. Uh, how else would he get to them? You know. And <laughs> <laughs> he didn't want to tell you the inside scoop. He didn't know. That's it. He was just pissed off that that the wrestlers were paying attention to this you know kid who nobody ever heard of before and. You know, he he just he just you know, you know from what he said the other day on Alvarez's site, he just you know had a lot of cojones and just knew how to sweet talk people and you know that that's three quarters of the job in wrestling. Yeah. Now, on a related note, did you ever have any dealings with Terry Justice? You know what? I talked to him on the phone once. That's it. He sounded like a really nice guy. Um. Um. Uh, yeah. You know I'm asking. Oh, right. Because Thanks, Gilbert stuff. Okay, that was the fast. There was a lot of unusual stuff. Remember, he did. Did he do a fan club for Eddie Gilbert? He, didn't, he did a fan club for Eddie Gilbert before he broke in. Is what I heard. Yes. Yes. And there were a lot of odd stories, which I, I know they had a big falling out. Yeah. And I, I heard a lot of stories about Terry Justice. I, I, I mean, what it sounds like was he was a very nice guy, but a little, you know, like a lot of people in wrestling, a little odd. But um, I remember I, he was a good friend with Tom Burke, and I remember uh, uh, the Justice family was all good friends with Dr. Jerry Graham. And I remember uh, uh, Tom Burke telling me about uh, when Terry Justice was killed in the car wreck. And yeah, I'd never met him, but I talked to him on the phone once before. Um, and I remember telling, you know, I, I went to tell the doc, and somehow he already heard about it. And you know, Doctor Jerry Graham, that w- who wasn't shaken up by much in life, was really bummed about uh, Terry Justice died, and um, uh, and I guess Terry Justice, <laughs> I guess the Justice family was an interesting family. The the mother was a was supposed to be a really really sweet lady, and uh, the way it was described, she was a very sweet person, but sometimes had a kind of odd viewpoint on the hierarchies in the universe i guess above the their mantle or something like that there were three photos one was like of george washington next to that was a photo i of some other figure like uh i don't know maybe abraham lincoln and then the third photo was of dr jerry graham (laughs) (laughs) are you sure you're not talking about your mantle uh, yeah, well, the, <laughs> that would be on my mantle. I <laughs> yours would have cardigan, though. Yeah, I'd have cardigan, and yeah. I would have a uh, you know flowers and incense burning next to it, and a <laughs> momia on the other side. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Yeah. The kings of wrestling. You wouldn't have any presidents of the United States. That's ridiculous. Oh yeah, that is ridiculous. I mean, oh my That's god, talk about the, the best workers in the world. <laughs> That's going a little. Well, I mean, maybe Lincoln, but I don't know about George Washington. Yeah, because he actually was a worker. <laughs> well, what did George Washington ever do, really? <laughs> Yeah, he had wooden teeth. I think that's about it. Yeah, I mean, he, he could could he could he do a toe hold? <laughs> I doubt could it. He, I mean, you know, up? he just knew how to stand up in a rowboat. That's it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, Lincoln at least can lock up and. Yeah, yeah, he he. You know, I, I wonder if I wonder if Lincoln was the first one to do the gimmick where he had he uh, the guy would have him in a wrist lock and then he'd take the guy down by pulling his hair. And... <laughs> Oh, I have and, it on and, good and authority. And, you know, they must have believed Lincoln when he said it, he didn't pull it. That's right. That's right. He shook his head, no, 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 no. And when people, you know, countered, <laughs> yes, like, he hey, did, on, he'd scream, Lincoln. shut up, shut up, shut up. That's what he would do. <laughs> and he also invented the choke slam. Oh, that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I think that one was a giant. Drawing. Or Nova stole it. <laughs> you, know oh. why I, you know why I was going to bring up, when you were bringing up kayfabe memories? The, the What's that? Kayfabe? What I was wondering, I wanted to find out they were going to do another guest booker. For, um, no, no, that's KFA commentaries. Yeah, they but, have I, the but they, they have a little. They have a forum there. They have a forum there, and I wanted to know if they were going to do another one. <laughs> sure, 
sure they will. <laughs> I, I'd never even... I've heard of Guest Booker in another source, but I don't know if I heard about it on Kayfabe Commentaries. No, yeah, they're, they're, they're the ones who came up with it. Yeah, they're the ones that came up with it. On K-Fabe oh, okay. Memories, on Kayfabe Memories, they have a section there for where they answer questions and stuff. And I, I wanted to find out, after watching after watching Cornette, I want to see if anybody else, they have plans. I'd be, I'd be interested. I mean, one of the... Well, kind of interested because I... I, I I feel bad. Cornette, Cornette, I could listen to anything he said, and Paul yeah. Heyman, for that matter. Now, if you could resurrect Jack Pfeffer, that's the guest booker I would want to hear. <laughs> you know, the, the, the thing is, like, I think it's a great idea, but like, it's the only. I, I think Cornette mentioned he only put in like four hours worth of work. And yeah. besides, it's so speculative because when you're doing guest booker, you're assuming that all the wrestlers are going to show up on time and cooperate yeah. with all the angles. But even but, still, I mean, there's, I, it kind of seems, because he would ask them, and they wouldn't really know what, like, he'd be like, I'm assuming this, you know, like, when, when he wants to know about somebody specific, like, if mm-hmm. they're available, they'll be like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, w- one of my it's favorite, when I think about, like, the complexities of booking and stuff like that, the story I, I love hearing the most is uh, Jeff Walton, who was the publicist for Mike LaBelle for many years, uh-huh. you know, <clears throat> He said when he first started working for the promotion, the booker was Jewel Strongbow. And this was probably the mid-60s. And so here he is. He's going into a booking meeting, and uh, he's expecting, like, this well-thought-out, you know, planned angle. And um, he says there's Jewel Strongbow just kind of sitting back in his chair saying, okay, tonight on TV... uh, yeah, we'll do the thing where, you know, uh, so-and-so comes to ringside and distracts the referee and the baby face gets hit from behind and the heel goes over. And Jeff Walton's thinking, like, that's it? And uh, I guess somebody actually asked Will Strongbow, well, we did that just a few years ago. And <laughs> Strongbow shrugged and said, old ideas still work. <laughs> yeah. That reminds me of uh, getting, in Gary Hart's book. Mm-hmm. He talks about how you know, he, there's this part we get into. Even though I've referred to myself as a booker up to this point, I actually considered myself a matchmaker. And he goes into this whole thing about how he thought that the really good bookers were more. He like he would call, talk about like him, Pat Patterson, Jim Barnett, maybe you know Dusty, a couple other people, maybe Eddie Graham. That like he would call them matchmakers. He said like a booker is a guy who puts the good guys against the bad guys and hopes that it works. And a matchmaker is someone who listens to the fan responses and acts accordingly. That's that's probably a good way of putting it. I mean, one thing, you know, as much as, you know, I've made Tom Ernesto jokes, you know, about his booking and stuff like that, you know, yeah, the booker might put the angles together, but the booker's responsibility, uh, at least back in the regional days, uh you know, I was told it was the biggest headache in the world because not only did you have to do the angles, you were responsible for the wrestlers showing up on time. You were responsible for for people, you know, having you know leading man, you know, fits. You know, uh, you were responsible for everything under the sun. And yeah. go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, in a lot of territories, the Booker was in charge of everything. Really, like Gary Hart in Texas was running the company. Rich yeah, and I'm barely I, doing anything. Yes, yeah, and uh, you know, many territories, you know, the way it would work is, you know, the booker, one booker would be around for a while, and they'd use another booker. And you know, I've never even really talked with anybody about this, but I always wonder if it's just because they wanted fresh booking, or if bookers just got really, really burnt out. Um, I remember Jeff Walton saying that the greatest bookers in L.A. were Charlie Moto and Leo Garibaldi, and. I, man, I'd love to talk to him and ask who it was who thought up the whole Blassie Tolis angles. Because I heard those ones were actually pretty well thought out. Kurt Vince Russo's never burned out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Isn't that a shame? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still waiting for his burnout. Yeah. And you know the sad thing is, like, you, you look at the TNA roster and it's like, they've actually got some pretty good wrestlers that's like, eh. Oh, there's talented. I mean, yeah. there's talent from from the indie level to the big level. I mean, there's just um, you know immensely talented wrestlers. But 
I don't know. It just seems like, I don't know. It's, I don't even know what to say. It's just a different business now. And um, it's, a, it's, it's a thoroughly different business than it was a generation ago. And actually, I think that's the cyclical story of wrestling. I, I, if we were, if it was 1950s right now and the three of us were talking, we'd probably be saying the same thing because I remember reading a, a book called The Magnificent Scufflers that was printed in the late 1950s. And the old timers were saying, "Oh, this wrestling today is just a bunch of phony crap. They don't know how to do things." And sure enough, the wrestlers, you know, the old timers in the '70s were saying that about uh, that. You know, the material then. You know, old timers today are saying it about the current product. And yeah, but old timers today have a reason. I mean, it's really bad. Like <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. It's, it's like it's, I'm not. I'm not because I know. I know what you're saying. Like all, we be are complaining about it all the time, but. There's just some stupid stuff going on everywhere. It's not no, it, it, you're you're it's, actually you are right about that. It's it, not, it's, it's, not, it's not it's not just like here. It's everywhere. Like you just go watch the show and it's like, oh my god, the show is so boring. Yeah, well, you know, conspiracy theories. I think are ninety nine percent pure whack job. You know, you know theories. But it would not shock me if somebody said, hey, there's been a conspiracy theory. A bunch of people. You know, a bunch of people got together, led by a guy named, guy named Vince Russo, and they all bet money on each other to see who could, you know, drive wrestling into the ground the worst, who could come up with the worst long-term storylines. Because it's so funny, like, whenever they talk about UFC and mixed martial arts taking over, and it's like, yeah, they're taking over. I'm like, yeah, they're taking over because everybody's just doing, like, the worst crap possible. I mean... Yeah, and here it is. UFC, you know, mixed martial arts is not even a work, but the storylines are more consistent with anything, even with unpredictable, you know, unpredictable outcomes, you know, it, it, it's not rocket, you know, they realize it's not rocket science, they know how to promote a feud, yeah. you know, and it could even be, you know, the main event can even be a squash match like the Brock Lesnar Frank Muir match, but, but it's, <laughs> it was the show of the year. It, it, it's too easy to just put all the place to blame on one, uh, on something else as opposed to, like with Mexico. You know how they're saying how Mexico's being killed by WWE and all this stuff? I mean, if you watch what AAA and CMLL are doing nowadays, it's like they don't really need WWE's help to kill themselves, you know? No, exactly. <laughs> That's a very good point. They're, they're, they're doing a pretty good job on their own. I mean, uh, they, yeah, they're doing, yeah, they only have themselves. If, if anything goes wrong, they only have themselves to blame because, for one thing, WWE is essentially a TV show that occasionally does a tour of the country. Yeah. You know, I mean, if WWE came there every week and was running regionally like they are, WWE would probably be the same fiasco. Yeah, because I mean, it's not it's not just it's not just because cause like with especially with CMLL, I mean, how hard is it for them to attract a lot of people to like a show? It's not, Lucha, but but Lucha Libre is totally different from what WWE provides. It is, and I I, I think Steve Sims, man, Steve Sims describes it so well, the way CMLL operates, and it. So true. They can afford to have a drought as far as audience goes for a long time because you know they they have low costs. They own a lot of their arenas. They're just really dumb at booking. <laughs> well, you know, they're. I wonder how much of it is they're dumb and how much of it they're just not inspired. Who is the booker yeah, right well, now? Is it Panico? Panico and um, I can't remember who the other people. Salazar. Who? So like Tony Salazar still or? It's Panico, and I think it's the other guy. What's his name? It's one of the one of those one of the. I think it's Guerrero del Futuro, isn't it? I don't remember what the guy. Yeah, I don't know. Guy. But you, you know, He's one on thing is that time. He's on TV all the time. He's always showing on the side. Yeah, I can't remember his name. I mean, I mean, I mean, it, it, I mean, CMLL. Yeah, they could do a better product, but I think they know that. They're in it for the long haul, and yeah, but it's not. It's not just that. They're really like. They're really not like their heel side. Like Steve said, they don't have that one star, but at the same time, they don't really build anybody up. Basically, like they have all these young guys, and immediately they're not drawing. Like before, they used to do that, mm-hmm. but now it's like they're instead of like building those guys up and continuing, they'll bring in somebody like Super Porky, and immediately put them back on top. So instead of like elevating Volador Jr. or Sombra, putting them up there. Yes. They pretty much just cut their legs from them, and people don't know they're not they're not as over as Mystico. Right. Now, no, that's true. But I, well, I know Stone Brush is well, a Hmm. It's, it's it's not it's it's one of the I should just write this down and explain it. <laughs> no, it, it's actually same here. Is is it's one of those 
it's one of those things where you have to write it down. Like there's so much weird. Yeah, stuff I'd actually love for Sims to write an essay about it. Uh, and actually, you should write it down because I'd love, love to read your take on it. It's, it's but not, it is true that they they could go for a, a drought for a long time and not have yeah. to worry. I mean, I remember that people were certain when AAA stole had that big talent raid. Yeah. Uh, that people were saying definitely this is the end of CMLL and. Yeah. You know, what I dug about them is well, they, uh, kind of, they didn't panic. Uh-huh. Well, the thing, the thing that helped CMLL was that they kind of got UWA guys towards the, to do that little feud for a while. Yes. Like that. And they had, they kept da- all those like good workers, like El Dandy, Nergo Casas. They still had all those good workers who worked the style that, that they like in um, that part of the country. But yeah. It's just like right now the problem is like they pretty much they're they're doing like this weird booking where nobody like all the I mean because you've actually seen a lot of technical starting to com- complain about how there's not a faction within the group you know on a technical side there's no faction mm-hmm. you know you have all these guys all <laughs> switching sides and everything so you have fans confused who's who are they supposed to root for who are they supposed to you know, right because if you think about it their big their last big shows who's been the main event. Can you remember? Well, I mean, the recent stuff I've watched, it all involves, like, Negro Casas, Mystico, Hector Garza. Well, the, the main main events, like the four big shows, it's all been it's been Mystico or uh, Heel versus Heel Man. Mm, okay. Cause it's which, which shows that I haven't followed as closely as I should be. <laughs> Mystico, Mystico versus Casas was the last one. Mm-hmm. Actually, that was the, no, the last one was the um, the Japanese guy on Yujiro versus Black Warrior. Both mm-hmm. of them are heels. So you're basically confusing all the people. They're going to cheer for Black Warrior either way. And then before that was Mystico Nero Casas. Before that was the cage match where they basically just threw a bunch of guys in there, Mexicans versus Japanese, the three Japanese guys. You know, people are going to root, root against the Japanese guys. Before that was uh, Raymond, uh, Raymond Viano 5 versus Ultimo Guerrero. And then before that was uh, Blue Panther versus Viano 5 where they pretty much screwed Blue Panther over with that one to a mass flaw. Yeah, I, I actually thought that was a very smart move. <laughs> yeah, it was a smart move. That oh, was a really much, good move. It really killed Blue Panther, though. It pretty much killed It Blue did, Panther. but I mean, face it. It killed Blue Panther. He's in the twilight yeah. of his career. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I, I would watch him when yeah, he's you, 70. See, the problem with that is you're giving it to Viano 5, who basically isn't a guy who people really want to watch. Right. No, that's it's true. Because- I think if they gave it to Ultimo Guerrero, then I think that somehow Blue Panther would have done better after. Yeah. I mean, it's not that much better because, you know, the taking the mask off him did ruin his look so much. Yeah. But... Because it, it, like yeah. it dropped him to Negro Navarro and Blue... Black exactly. Blue. That's what I was going to say. He, now he just looks like Negro Navarro. And he doesn't have the fountain of youth like Satanica. That does, is a good so. point. <laughs> that is a good point, but I just love that they had something so from left field because I remember when that match was booked, I figured, well, guess we're going to see what Viano 5 looks like now. Yeah. And, and then they, they made the mistake going with Viano 5 losing to Ultimo Guerrero, which they probably should have done a tag match to elevate like somebody ex, you know, additional just to get rid of Viano. <laughs> yeah. Now, you know what this means, Fredo? This means I'm going to be showing up at your door very soon, very soon for more, even more CMLL tapes so I can get DVDs, I mean, so I can get even more up on what's happening. Yeah. Now, you should ask him for old IWRG instead. Yeah, the IWRG is really good. The, I haven't watched the recent stuff. I'm just thinking about, like, I remember that old, that stuff I always used to get from you, like, back in, like, 2000 to, like, 2002. Yeah, that was really good. Especially the, the the one match with remember the one match where where everyone does a tope into the crowd. <laughs> they, did, they were doing that for a little like for a couple of weeks, weren't they? No, but that? you know that one match that I'm talking about where like Super Mega like boomerangs himself. Oh yeah, where they were going over the ramp, right? Over yeah, the, I mean, over the, the yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah, Kurt's got to see that. <laughs> oh, I, there's a lot I have to see. I you know, if Fredo can tell you this is I the all the recent CMLL that I watched, I was so dazzled by the Negro Casas Mystico feud that I've been neglecting a lot of the other performers. I have a lot to catch up on. Yeah, and, and, and it, 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 it was that was a bigger problem with CMLL because they have so much talent and then you're just seeing like them like pass over these other guys because they have a certain type of guy that they want to bring up. Like, to, you know, they'll, they'll get the older guys or they'll get the really muscular guys. You know, like it's funny, history's kind of repeating itself because I'll, I'll never forget... Uh, 
when uh, Ultimo Dragon was still Acai and was working with UWA, you uh-huh. know, wrestling Casas frequently, is uh, it was Wally Yamaguchi and Physico were giving him a ride to Tijuana, and he was saying the exact things that you are saying right now, but in relation to UWA. Oh, that, wow. That none of the young guys are being ele- elevated, um, yeah. and they're just relying on uh, the old folks. Now, this is after Flores died, though. I'm yeah. sorry? This would have been after Francisco Flores died. Yeah. Oh, yes, definitely, definitely. I mean, it really went down... Hill. I, I know Conan said something about it was strictly the problem with TV is why UWA uh, fell to the ground. But I mean, there there was some I don't know there was some really repetitive booking. Yeah. You know, I mean, maybe Conan's right, but it it seemed like there was a lot of discontent with the younger wrestlers and the and the lighter wrestlers too. Yeah. Uh, now, but yeah. but I remember Physico saying that. Ultimo uh, Dragon was was like complaining about it for most of the car ride, and just <laughs> he was like livid about it because I, apparently there were tons of like, well, I mean, Espanto Junior, uh, who was probably the only you know at the time the only guy equaled with Negro Casas and Asai. Yeah. I mean, he was just a heel. Yeah, yeah, just a little tag wrestler there. It wasn't until he went to AAA where he really got the push he deserved. Espanto Junior, right? Yeah. Well, he was badly. Great, he was great before that. Before you did. He oh, he was. He was yeah, because I saw some of those UWA shows, and the thing I kept thinking is, why isn't this guy on top? Yeah. You know, I mean, not not even being put over on top, but just being involved with the main angles. This guy is the most dynamic worker, and it's really sad that you know he OD'd so young. You know, and yeah. you know, but I mean. At least he didn't die, though. So no, he didn't die, but it permanently ruined his health. I mean, well, he was dead for a few minutes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He was clinically dead, is what I heard. I, he was he was just such a great worker. Should have been the original zombie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, seriously, come on. I the like the way what? you think, Alfredo. <laughs> the original <laughs> zombie. Well, you, and that's what that's what's really going on with CMLL. They're just like they're they and then the whole thing with the Japanese guys. They they. Mm-hmm. Uh, They've kind of kept going a little too long with that. I think yeah. Was, I think the reason was that those guys were supposed to be in TNA for a little longer. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like I said, I, it, the, the fact that they could afford to um, draw poor crowds, that it won't ruin their yeah, existence. It won't. I mean, it, it's probably, maybe they're just really uninspired. Maybe, I mean, has, Panic, has Panico been the chief booker for a long time now? I believe he has been for a while. I mean, may, I mean, if they really wanted to turn things around, maybe it's a matter of, Changing bookers, maybe. But you know the thing I is, I think like, he's, it's been about like at least five years that he's been booking. Yeah. I think. But, but yeah, you know, the thing is, like he could, they they could just do the same because they do so many of those tournaments and torneos cibernéticos and all that. They could just do the same thing over and over. Mm-hmm. They, they're they're not doing that. They, they haven't done that this year. They've kind of cut back on that. Interesting. You know the the best angle this year in 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 CMLL was the was in Puebla. They did in Puebla. Uh, in Puebla, and their their promotion, they did a, a, a CMLL minis versus CML versus the Pueblo locals. Oh no way! The local talent, they had them feuding with the the midgets. Oh, that oh, that's kind of cute. <laughs> so they had on. Um, See, my Sky Low Low theory isn't that far off. Well, actually, Zuki showed up at one of the shows drunk. I think. <laughs> I think Bihari <laughs> brought it up on one of the. He brought it up that apparently Zuki showed up drunk. I'd love to know how much how much it takes to make Zuki drunk. <laughs> Probably not a lot. But he, did they, Awesome they, Kong kick his ass after that? They just, well, they did like this, like this, where they just beat him up and just threw him out, and they had a, a handicap match where they. Just oh, got gotcha, you, got gotcha. you. So I guess the follow up was a case, but they did it like for three weeks. So it's just like a feud for three weeks, which. That's really sweet. Nice. I, I then that's imaginative. Yeah, that's the I mean, spirit of Jack Pfeffer and Cardig Yon calling your name, man. That was saying, get out of here. This is where the money is. Take it out of Puebla, put it into Reina Colise was what I would do. Because a lot of the female CML minis aren't really that small, you know, they're pretty regular sized. Yeah, yeah, no, this is true. I, it's almost silly to have them be minis when you think of that. Well, man, y- y- gentlemen, we've we're approaching <laughs> two hours, the two right? hour mark, so I guess it's uh, a. I, I I could talk. To be honest, I could talk all night, but you man, work. I have to go to work tomorrow. I man, I I gotta find a job just being 
cat-like and lazy, you know, we gotta short bursts podcast. of energy followed by long naps and television. Kurt, we got to make money on the podcast and stop working, you know? Yeah, is there a money mark out there who wants to just give us a bunch of money? Please, somebody, if you're listening, if you have a lot of money and you just want to get rid of it, give it to us. We'll probably hate you and do nothing good for you, you know? The money marks are stuck loaning require money right now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Kurt, did you hear about that? What's that? About wait, the uh, high, high com loan. Highspots dot com. Wait, 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 wait. It's just they loaned um they loaned Rick Flair money. Do you know that, that that long bout of silence is me in shock. Okay, well he, he put up the end the old NWA World Title belt, the one before the big gold belt as collateral. I, I, I thought I thought you were joking. At no. First. Okay, but he put up the belt as collateral. He didn't yeah. pay them back, so they put it up for auction. They got like a seventy-five thousand dollar bid. There were people saying that they already had a sale before they put it up, but did it to try to get more attention and maybe get more money. Then it comes out this week. Flair already put up the belt as collateral for a previous loan from a a plumbing and heating valve company. <laughs> so High Spots had to take the auction down. They are screwed and probably have to either sue Flair or press charges. And the uh, the plumbing and heating company could has the right to take the belt before them. And Flair also like he put up everything as collateral for that. I mean he oh put up my Lord. his robes, his trunks, his boots, um, the watch that Shawn Michaels gave him, the Hall of Fame okay. ring, you know the you know a, a, all this like there was also one like there was a line that was like and various unnamed items or something too. It was like. So yeah, is, okay. Is this just is just just me getting loopy, or is there something really sad about that? Yeah, I, you know, you. It would doesn't think shock that. me. It doesn't. No, it doesn't shock me. That's the sad thing. Is it doesn't shock me. That's what's sad. But you know, you would think that, like high spots would know not to loan rustlers money. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, you know, exactly. I, I've I've known Mike for a long time. I mean, you would think he would have because he's he he's actually given me advice in the past about writing for other people, and he always told me how much are they going to pay you, and I was like, yeah, that's true. Wow. You would think he would have. I guess he kind of. I mean, that's a that's a shocker. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I I wouldn't say I'm shocked, but still, it's 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 astounding at the same time. I mean, Blair must be a sweet talker. Now I like I like Mike and I like High Spots, but this is also not the first time they've done something like this lately. You know those Memphis DVDs they've been putting out? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They paid Corey Macklin to license rights to Memphis footage and use tapes from elsewhere, like the stuff Cornette sent to, sent to Rob Feinstein. Feinstein gave it to them. Anyway, as far as I know, Corey Macklin does not own the rights to the Memphis footage. <laughs> whoa, whoa. As best anyone can tell, the guys who bought the USWA for the inflated price own it. Yeah, they, don't they own it? Who? The the guys who bought USWA. That's what I'm saying. As far as I know, they own it. Oh, my gosh. And have not done anything with it and don't even, you know, go yeah. after, like, Glawler and stuff when they did the TV show with the classic stuff. Yeah. There, there must be something when you actually get involved deep into the business. Cause, you know, I've always had to be, like, a side thing with my involvement in wrestling. But, I mean, because I've, I've known people who, when they're not involved in wrestling, seem to have a pretty good bird's eye view of just how many con men there are in it, how many sweet talkers. But then when they get involved, it the, the vision gets muddy, they, and they fall into the same traps. I, I don't know if there's something like once you get involved, if common sense leaves you or if you get caught up in the moment or caught up in, like, you know, an exciting business proposition. But, yeah. I mean, it's not the first time I've heard something like this. It still it still kind of blows my mind when I hear it, and at the same time it's like, oh, I've heard this story a, a, a lot, you know. I'm sure it makes you happy that you decided not to work full-time for Isle Oh, Oh, totally. <laughs> I, you know, 